Hello again, everybody. And uh, we're ready to pick up with our third lecture. And as you know, up until now, we've been spending a little bit of time thinking about the uh, natural history of wolves and what their lives are all about and their ecology. And I ended the last lecture with uh, just kind of some broad questions about, well, why, why wolves? Why would we care about wolves in the first place? Why not some other creature? And, and the, I ended with these kinds of questions, and, and I gave an allusion to the answer, which is basically that wolves are not only important for their own sake, but wolves are also important because they reflect a great deal about our relationship with nature in the most broad and general sense. And they also uh, reflect, uh, uh, in some important ways, our state of knowledge about nature in the most general sense. And they even reflect a little bit something about ourselves. And so uh, in this short lecture, what I want to do is just uh, highlight a few things about wolves. They're not so much related to Isle Royale in particular, but they, uh, but they help kind of round out our understanding of, of wolves and why it is that so many people are so interested in them. And so this is really uh, just kind of an eclectic set of, uh, of, of, of pieces of information about wolves. So just uh, appreciate that as, as we go along. The first thing is just about the, the persecution and recovery of wolves. Uh, the comments that I want to make will be especially focused in North America. The map that we're looking at here shows the former, his, uh, former range of wolves, where it is that they used to live. That would be the areas in green and red combined. And then the places that they live today uh, are indicated by, by the areas in green. If we focus just on the United States portion of this map, and in particular the lower 48, one of the things that we see is that by, the, well, by about the year 2010, wolves occupied no more than about 15% of their historic range. They occupied uh, a region in the northern Rockies, a region in the upper Great Lakes, and then a very small region in the desert southwest. This represents, as I mentioned, about 15% of their historic range. And so what, one of the very important questions that we hear about in the newspapers regularly is, are wolves in, recovered uh, in the sense of no longer needing protection from the Endangered Species Act? Are they endangered? The words recovery and endangered might mean different things. And of course, what happens is it, is it begs this question, well, what is recovery? Or what does it mean to be endangered? If we can answer those questions, then we'll maybe more easily be able to tell whether wolves are endangered or not. And, you know, I think this is a situation where you can be kind of a, uh, is, is the glass half full or is the glass half empty kind of a person? And you can probably be both of those types of persons at the very same time. And here's what I mean by that. In about the year 1950, there were at most a few hundred wolves in the lower portion of the United States, and those few hundred wolves would have lived up in the northern part of Minnesota. And now today, there are uh, about 5,000 wolves in the, in the lower portion of the United States, and again, in this northern Rockies, upper Midwest, and, uh, and, and the desert Southwest. And so this is a remarkable recovery to go f basically in 60 years' time from a few hundred wolves to more than 5,000. It exceeds the expectations of, of every wolf biologist who started working on wolf conservation, basically working on it in earnest in the 1970s. And, it, and, it, and uh, it's just really a remarkable recovery. There's no doubt about it. It. However, what's important to know is that the number of wolves that used to be here numbered more than a half a million. And so while it's great recovery, is probably, well, this question remains, are we all done or are we only partway there? And, 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 and here's this great example of where wolves just represent this sort of thing. How do we want to get along with nature? Do we want to get along with nature by uh, letting some species be in only very small portions of the places they used to be? Or do we want... Um, most species to be in as many places as possible compared to where they had used to have been. And now some people would say, oh, well, this is just unrealistic. You can't have wolves in, in, in many of the places in the United States. There's simply too many, too many people living in these places. Well, all right, there's, there's important truth to that situation, or to, that, that, to that concern. But one of the things is that, is that Europe and the nature of wolves in Europe challenges us in a very important way. This map of Europe shows where wolves live uh, presently. And what I want to point out in particular is this area right here where wolves uh, live in Spain, and then this area basically on both sides of the Adriatic Sea in Italy and then the Slavic countries. These are parts of Europe that are really quite densely populated with people. These are places where it can be argued that people and wolves have 
pretty well learned to figure out how to get along. And it, it's, it's not the wolves that have trouble figuring it out. It's the people that have trouble figuring it out. However, the life of a wolf in these places is different than it is in North America. In these places, you know, poaching and human causes of mortality are, are really quite high. So an argument could be made, well, maybe life is not quite as good in some of these places, not quite as good for wolves in these places where so many people are. So it's, it's a complicated thing about, uh, about where wolves should be allowed to be. And again, it kind of reflects this general attitude that we have with nature. Jumping to a different topic now. There's a debate that maybe many people are not aware of right now, a scientific debate, about how many species of wolves live in North America. The conventional answer is that there's one species of wolf, and it goes by the Latin name, scientific name, Canis lupus. But there's another idea that's been being uh, worked on for about the last 10 years now or so, and it proposes that there are two species of wolves, Canis lupus, and then another species called Canis lycaon that, in, uh, that would have lived, and these maps that I'm showing here are the historic ranges, uh, it would have suggested that this Canis lycaon would have lived in the eastern part of North America. Here's a little more detail of how this two-species hypothesis runs. Now, in order to understand this two-species hypothesis, we have to uh, appreciate a little bit of vocabulary that's indicated right here in this box. And so there's Canis latrans, is the, is the Latin name for coyotes. Canis lycaon is this word for the eastern wolf, and Canis lupus is what some people would like to call the western wolf. Okay, so here's basically the history of what may have happened, and it goes uh, in a series of steps. Step number one is that one to two million years ago, there would have been a single ancestral canid, and it would have lived in North America. And then the second step is that some of those creatures, some of those ancestral canids would have migrated to Europe and Asia and would have eventually become Canis lupus. However, some of these individuals would have stayed in North America. And then what would have happened more recently is that, rather recently in fact, is that between 150 and 300,000 years ago in North America, that ancestral canid would have diverged into two creatures that we know today, Canis latrans, the coyote, and Canis lycaon, this, what some people like to call the eastern wolf. And then the next thing that would have happened is that in Europe and Asia, Canis lupus, the, 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 the wolf, uh, the gray wolf, would have diverged into a number of different subspecies, just different variants, and one of those subspecies would have come back from Europe and Asia back into North America during the Pleistocene relatively short period of time ago on the order of 10,000 years ago or so. This is just an idea. We don't know if this hypothesis is true or not. What it depends on, basically, is, is rather complicated interpretations of, of genetic patterns of wolves living across North America. But I think what's important about it is just that you know, wolves are one of the most studied species on the planet, species of mammals, anyways, on the planet. And how could you have such a well-studied species and not be able to answer a very simple question, are there one kind or two kinds of them in, the, in North America? We can go a little, a little bit further. This uh, set of maps uh, represents a, a particular study that was published in just the year 2009. It's another genetic study. And basically what these geneticists had shown is uh, the map that we're looking at here on the right-hand side is, is from the western part of North America, the pr Canadian province of British Columbia. Each one of the dots in this map represents a location where a wolf genetic sample was, was collected, blood sample, and, uh, and so we can see a bunch of samples were collected here on the west coast and then some other samples over here more in the interior. These are mostly mountain regions. And here's the point of it all, is that the samples that were collected on the, on the coast all end, up become, all end up representing a particular mitochondrial haplotype. That's indicated by the fact that they're all of that blue color. And then as you go into the interior, most of the individuals are of two different types, haplotypes, mitochondrial haplotypes or mitochondrial kinds that they were carrying. And those are indicated by the different sets of color, the yellow and kind of these orangish, orangish red types of colors. And here's the point, is that the authors of these these papers conclude that these coastal wolves should be considered their own, and they use this phrase, evolutionary significant unit. It's not, uh, they're not so different as to be different subspecies, but they definitely have this phylogenetic or evolutionary history that makes them different enough to be considered uh, you know, 
a different, if you will, a different kind of wolf. And so, again, both of these stories, the one about one species or two species in North America, at this very large scale, and then down at this finer scale, just you know, on the coast or the interior of British Columbia, you know, we, we, we have this question, how many different kinds of wolves there are, and in an important sense, we don't have a good answer for that. And again, it's, it's, it's something to be marveled at, I think, to just for a species that's so well studied that we would be, we would be stuck by that. Jumping to another topic, some of you may know, but just to, to, you know, to say it so straightforwardly and, and clearly, domestic dogs are basically, if you like, a subspecies of the wolf. A, a proper name for a domestic dog is not always the name that's used, but a proper one would be to call it Canis lupus familiaris, uh, a subspecies of, of the wolf. Now, archaeological evidence suggests that, that dogs may have been domesticated by about 30,000 years ago. That's a long time ago in terms of human history. 30,000 years ago, we had not developed agriculture by that time. Neanderthals were still alive and uh, doing well on the planet. Archaeological evidence also suggests that the association between humans and wolves would have uh, gone back to maybe 100,000 years ago. Uh, genetic evidence suggests that wolves and dogs also uh, diverged about 100,000 years ago. And domestication is, of dogs may, have be, may be something that occurred at multiple times in different parts of the planet. And uh, this is one of the really important reasons that wolves are so important to humans in understanding them. Be because dogs and wolves are essentially the same thing and we have such close relationships with dogs. And the connections are pretty deep. Why is it the dogs do so well living with us? Well, because dogs are used to living in packs. Packs are families. Humans are used to living with families. So we're all family living creatures. And this is one of the things that, uh, that uh, you know, makes for this close connection between humans and dogs and consequently wolves. Jumping topics again, just kind of hitting some highlights, some really interesting things about wolves, and in this case now dogs. Body size. The body size of an animal is one of the most basic traits that it has. And even just take just mammals. Mammal, and even take, if you will, just terrestrial mammals. Terrestrial mammals range in size from a very, very small pygmy shrew, all, weighing just uh, a few grams, all the way up to, to an African elephant. Now, one thing that's important about dogs is that dogs, one species, Canis lupus familiaris, shows more variation in body size than any other terrestrial mammal on the planet. Almost two orders of magnitude range in size. The very smallest breeds of dogs weighing less than a kilogram. The very largest breeds of dogs weighing in excess of 80 kilograms. What was recently discovered just a few years back is that, uh, is that this variation in body size is very importantly controlled by a single gene. It uh, has a technical uh, d name for it. It's the IGF-1 gene. And uh, what's important about this gene is that it's pr present in, in, uh, in many, many organisms, including humans. And so a large, uh, one, well, one of the most important phenomena that we understand about living creatures, how big are they, our great insights come from studying dogs. And one we learn from that is that a single gene controls a large portion of that, of that variation. Another uh, just kind of again a highlight interesting thing that we've learned about wolves in the, in the last several years has to do with coat color. Wolves basically come in three different colors. Black, white, and gray, with gray really representing a, a, a wide range of colors that range from almost white to almost gray. One of the things that we've known is that dark colored or, or black wolves, if you like, they occur only in North America. And there's a lot of variation across North America in terms of how many black wolves are in a population. So, for example, in Yellowstone, uh, almost two-thirds of the wolves are black. In the Arctic, only about 7% of the wolves are black. Okay? And this is maybe not too surprising. If you're a black wolf, you might not do very well on a white landscape. That part's pretty straightforward. What we relatively recently learned is that, well, is where that black coloration came from. It turns out 
dogs that have black coloration arose about 50,000 years ago. It occurred in domestic dogs. So after humans had domesticated dogs, apparently what had happened is that by random mutation, some dogs turned out to be black. The people that were uh, breeding these dogs, the people who were taking care of these dogs and controlling who got to breed with whom, must have decided they liked black dogs and, and selected for that, making black dogs more and more common as time goes on. And then what happened about 10 to 15,000 years ago is that black coat color, the gene for black coat color, transferred from domestic dogs back into wild wolves. This is the first uh, uh, indicator, or the first uh, occasion that we know of where a gene has gone from a domestic wild animal back to, uh, to its wild counterpart. Just really, I mean, just a, a pretty interesting kind of remarkable story and so anyways the question why wolves well the answer to this question why wolves uh, is is not only because wolves are important for understanding healthy ecosystems and not only because wolves are important for their own sake but because wolves have you know kind of a generally close connection uh, to humans and uh, and it inspires our curiosity in this way and so anyways, this ends the, the, the bit of information that I wanted to share with you about why wolves. And uh, our next lecture will focus more, especially on Isle Royal, and in particular the methods that we've been using to study questions on Isle Royal and what those questions have been. So thank you very much, and, and we'll see you at the next lecture.